Welcome back to the second segment of this public law law session on parliamentary sovereignty. Now before the break, we considered the background and a brief definition and I introduced you to Dice's tripartite concept and what we want to start with now is to start by looking at the first point that Dicey makes and it is that Parliament can make law concerning anything uh, in respect of its lawmaking abilities. Now Parliament is said to be legislatively supreme. It is subordinate to no one or no thing. It is omnipotent in its own omnipotence as it were. Now unlike in other countries where there is a written constitution where ordinary or constitution courts have the power to determine whether the acts of the legislature are constitutional. In the UK, the doctrine of parliamentary supremacy or parliamentary sovereignty dictates that parliament can legislate even on constitutional matters by a simple act of parliament. So for example, in your own country, you might consider uh, if you are outside the UK, you would consider, for example, looking at what your uh, constitution says in the and you would arguably if this was going to be affected by your legislature it would have to see whether it conflicts with the uh, with the constitution in the UK that's not the case parliament can pass an act of parliament and it can get rid of certain rights now statutes are made by the Queen in Parliament a body with three components the Queen and both houses of Parliament now, the Parliament Act of 1911 amended this so as not to require the approval of a bill by the House of Lords under certain circumstances. So, in effect, what you have is what is termed a suspensory veto. So, there are cer certain situations where a bill can be passed without uh, the Lord's input. Now, this was amended further to reduce the period of the veto by the Parliament Act of 1949. Now the implications of course is that this body is indeed omnipotent and free to legislate on anything it wishes and immune to any questions of validity in the UK courts. This, this view of course adheres to the traditional theory of parliamentary sovereignty. Now when we consider its ability to legislate on any subject, then there are certain examples that we have seen uh, both in, in, uh, historically uh, and in respect of the uh, statutes. Now, Parliament, for example, has changed uh, succession to the throne in the past uh, in respect of the Bill of Rights 1689 and also in the Act of Settlement 1701 and His Majesty's Declaration of Abdication Act of 1936. All of these considered succession to the throne. Now, indeed, when you look at uh, other acts being considered in recent times, we see that they are seeking to also affect uh, succession rights in respect of the monarchy in that, for example, if William and Kate were to have a child and the first child is a girl, well, if the second child is a boy, the boy takes precedent in the line of succession. And it is under uh, consideration at the moment to see whether or not that ought to be changed. Parliament is free to change. These are the examples. Parliament has also transformed itself into a new body and they've done that through the Act of Union with Scotland 1707 and also the Act of Union with Ireland in 1800. Now Parliament has prolonged its own existence during wartime and we have seen Parliament create a Scottish Parliament with its own limited powers to legislate for Scotland and we see the Scotland Act 1998. Now, the unlimited legislative powers of parliaments needs to be considered when we consider, for example, domestic versus international law. So for example, there's a presumption of the courts that when construing statutes, parliament does not intend to legislate contrary to international law. And so as far as possible, a statute will be interpreted to avoid the conflict between the UK statute and the principles of international law. But that is not to say if the international law cannot be aligned to UK law, it may very well be that the House of Lords cannot do that sort of balancing exercise. So when you look at the case, look at the case of Mortensen and Peters in 1906, 
This concerned uh, fishing in waters covered by both international and UK law. And it was held that UK law was valid even though it contradicted international principles. Now, Lord Justice General said that an act of parliament duly passed by the Lords and the Commons and assented to by the Crown is supreme and we are bound to give effect to its terms. Now that's interesting because when you look at the case of Factor Team, Ex parte Factor Team, which you will get to grips at, uh, get to grip more grips with when we look at EU law, which is uh, an aspect of this series of public law lectures, you will see that in Factor Team, the idea that it affected an EU law right meant that the uh, the highest court in, in the UK did seek some guidance on this from the CJU. And so that is a far cry from Mortensen. Equally, when we look at the case of Cheney and Conn, which is where uh, this gentleman considered, well, he's not going to pay that part of his taxes that went to weapons of mass destruction. It can't be that you choose what part of the law, as it were, to abide by. Now, Justice uh, Ongood Thomas in, in, the, in that case said that what the statute itself enacts cannot be unlawful because what the statute says and what it provides is itself the law. And it is not for the court to say that a parliamentary enactment, the highest law in this country, is illegal. So international law cannot limit parliament's power. What about the passage of time then and retrospective legislation? Will that uh, limit parliament's power? Well, cases in point, Burma Oil and Lord Advocate in 1965, a case we've touched on variously for separation of powers, for rule of law, and again, for parliamentary sovereignty. Well, the case illustrates how parliament can legislate retrospectively, in this case, to avoid paying damages for wartime damage. Now, the War Damage Act, which came into force uh, retrospectively, the War Damage Act of 1965, denied entitlement to compensation for acts which were already committed, even though they weren't covered at the time. Now, the War Crimes Act, of 1991 is a similar example which quite rarely we see this but it provides retrospectively for criminalizing war crimes again parliament does not limit itself by the passage of time so when you look at that first uh, legislative supremacy we see that in the cases parliament is not constrained and we see certainly in the statutes that it is not constrained. What about Dice's second point? Dice says that a parliament cannot bind a future parliament. Make no mistake, when we talk about parliament, we're talking about this parliament, the parliament sitting. That is what is supreme because parliament can wipe out what a previous parliament has done. Now, Parliament cannot bind a future Parliament. Let's take a look at that. What that is saying is that it cannot limit its own legislative powers for the future, nor bind its successors, nor its predecessors. Now, the only limit some commentators say that it has is that it can't detract from its own continuing sovereignty. So it couldn't pass an act which then compromised its sovereignty. And the way we see this uh, uh, power in respect of not binding uh, or indeed uh, by binding its successor or indeed binding its predecessor, we have the principles of express repeal and implied repeal. Now, express repeal is when Parliament wishes to repeal an act of Parliament in whole or in part. It normally does so by an express clause to that effect in the later act. But maybe it doesn't do this. But by virtue of a later act, we see that there is some conflict. Well, implied repeal. If a later legislation is inconsistent with earlier legislation, the court invokes the doctrine of implied repeal, whereby the earlier act is impliedly repealed to the extent that it is inconsistent with the later act. 
Now, there are a couple of cases that you certainly need to know about. Uh, Vauxhall Estates and Liverpool, an earlier act favored by the plaintiff, was impliedly repealed. And Justice Avery said that until the contrary were decided, no act of parliament can effectively provide that no future act shall interfere with its provisions. Now, this was despite the earlier act of parliament stating that any act inconsistent with this act shall cease now shall in an act of parliament mean must shall cease to have effect or shall not or shall not have that effect now these latter words were seeking to tie the hands of a later parliament this was followed of course by the court of appeal in ellen street estates and minister of health where lord justice Mourn said it is impossible for parliament to enact that in a subsequent statute Dealing with the same subject matter, there can be no implied repeal. Now, this is said to be one limitation to parliamentary sovereignty. Parliament cannot bind the hands of a future parliament. But I want you to bear in mind that this aspect of parliamentary sovereignty has been affected by the UK's membership of the European uh, membership into the EU. And of course, we will look at this in some depth later on. The third point, of course, is the validity of an act of parliament. And the idea is that no person or body has the authority to rule on the val validity of parliament's enactment. Can it be challenged in the courts? Well, what we have seen is that the courts cannot challenge it, whether it be for procedural or for a substantive basis. When you look at countries that have a written constitution, a codified constitution, we see that the ordinary or constitutional courts have jurisdiction to determine whether um, any sort of legislation is unconstitutional. You don't have that in the UK because the act of parliament is supreme. And it is that the act of parliament remains unquestioned and two cases are clear on this point, Edinburgh and Dalkeith Railway and Watchope and Pekin and British Railways Board, of course. Other than uh, inspecting the parliamentary role to ascertain that it has passed through both houses and received the royal assent, a court will not inquire into any procedural or substantive irregularities as the bill proceeded through Parliament. Now, this is, in effect, enshrined in the Bill of Rights 1689, which provides that proceedings within the houses cannot be questioned in the court. It is for the speaker of a particular house to ensure that procedures, example, the standing orders are complied with. It is not for the court. So when we look at British uh, Pekin and British Railway, we see Mr. Pekin saying that the courts have not complied, sorry, Parliament had not complied with the procedures before uh, in in respect of passage of legislation court said that's not for us now whether the traditional theory remains impregnable we will consider shortly and in particular we will look at the impact of the eu membership and the enactment of the human rights act we will take a short break and immediately on our return we will consider something important before we get to eu membership and the hra hra we will look at manner and form we will look at entrenchment and what it means in UK law immediately after this short break. <music> 